now joining us from Abuja for the second segment of today's program is Rotimi Amechi. Amechi served as the Federal Minister of Transportation of Nigeria from 2015 to 2022. Prior to his ministerial work, he served as governor of River State from 2007 to 2015 and was speaker of the River State House of Assembly from 1999 to 2007. In 2022, Amechi declared his interest to contest in the 2023 presidential election and came second in the APC primaries behind Bola Tinubu. Very warm welcome to Perspectives today. Glad to have you with us. Let's move right on to the first question in discussing, glad to have you, in discussing your life after office. How has life been since you left office last year? And how do you balance your time spent on continued political matters with personal projects? Which hobbies do you have more time for today? No, no hobbies. No political activity. So I, I, I listened to Fashola. Mine is quite different. What I did upon leaving uh, politics, upon leaving office, was to get registered in the Nigerian Law School. So I just finished uh, a nine months course at the Nigerian Law School. I hope, hopefully, if I pass the exam, then I'll be called to, to buy in February. Uh, good to see you, <laughs> Hechi. Your colleague, um, yeah, I can hear you. Your colleague, Honorable Babatunde Pashola, Honorable Minister, said we should send our regards to you. So, so good to see you. Uh, I, 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 listen, I listened to him very well. I did, okay. and that was a good interview. Anyway, let me start. I, my first question is about adjustments. There's a perception that when the benefits of staying in power seems more lucrative than retirement or stepping down, there's a huge imbalance. In such cases, shifting gears from making impactful decisions to a more private life can be somewhat jarring. So how have you found purpose of fulfillment after leaving office? For me, it was seamless. It was actually seamless. The first thing you must realize is that I'm a bit too active. So I had to do what was necessary. What was necessary was to first get registered in the Nigerian Law School. At the same time, I got an admission with the King's College of London, where I, was, where I started my master's degree in law. I'll be completing my master's degree in law in July. Again, I was also doing a first degree course in law with the University of London. I did my last exam last year, last year, October, and you would be shocked to know that I failed two courses. So I'm repeating those two courses now. Out of five, I failed two because I was combining Nigerian law school. I was doing a master's in law, corporate and company law, and then I was doing an LLB program in, uh, at the University of London. So because of the multiplicity of the academic work, I think I had to fulfill two courses in uh, the LLB program. I'm repeating that this year, May. I hope I'll pass. If I pass, I'll have a second LLB degree. And by July, I'll have, be having a master's degree in corporate and company law, and then a BL in law. Hopefully that I'll be called to bar in February. Very interesting it to hear. Bit, like I said, it was a bit seamless. I didn't have the problem. Yeah. Excellent. Very interesting to hear that you've gone into education significantly. You have been involved in Nigerian politics for over 25 years. What key accomplishments do you continue to monitor today as your topmost legacy that must outlive you? And how have you put checks and balances in place to ensure continued operation and growth? Well, uh, it, the last part of the question is difficult to, uh, to respond to. The, why it's difficult to, to respond to is that it will depend on the, the government that took over from you and what they're ready to do. First is, I started, I want to repeat that, that I started the construction of Lekki Deep Seaport okay. and concluded it by September 2022. Concluded it by September 2022. And, uh, uh, I wasn't there when they commissioned it, but I, from time to time, I would like to know how they, they are managing. And I'm very happy that they're, they, they are moving on at the rate at which they're moving on. I'm also happy to, to note that, that that is the first seaport you have in Nigeria. Uh, the other ports, like I stated before, are river ports, the OT of the ocean. And that's, that's quite interesting to me. What other thing that is interesting to me is the railway. Uh, hopefully, they're also still operating. There is the Lagos Ibadan Railway, which is still operating. Uh, there is the uh, Abuja Kaduna. 
I hope that work is still ongoing in the Kano Kaduna part of it. Well, I was delighted to see CCCC, that's the company that's consulting the railway, publishing their this and that. They, they have completed the Portacot Meduguri, which was not only launched while I was the minister, but I disbursed the first set of funds uh, for them to commence work. So they have completed the lane of the rail lines. I hope too that they should be able to complete the, the stations. These are legacies that from time to time I, I would like to watch and they delight me a lot. Okay. That uh, I give a lot of time to all these things. So you see, moving from such numerous activities, if you go to just one activity, it would be difficult to slow down. That's why I said I had to take more than just one course. I had to do three courses to get all my energy in, in education and begin to slowly, slowly reduce them. Okay. In the political arena, the, the allure of power can be intoxicating and maintaining personal relationships can be difficult. Were you able to stay in touch with old friends despite the demands of your career? And did you get complaints about your inability to them whilst in office? Also, the, you know, that people say, people once in power have been known to talk about deafening silence that follows after their exit. Some are still struggling to come to terms with it. In your experience, how has the frequency of communication or calls changed since leaving office? What are the most important lessons mm -hmm. you have learned after your departure? Well, well I, I, I just think that I'm not among those who, who will say that uh, I don't have friends. I have a lot, huge number of friends that if the politicians go, you have another group of friends that you can always talk to all the time. Uh, so many social activities, people will invite you to come to parties. Uh, I'm not such of a protocol person. So while in office, I was like an every other, every other, other Nigerian. Uh, luckily, the law school enabled me to have young and new friends, very young and new friends in their 18, 20, no, no, I don't, well, I met few that were in their 30s, then those of us, they call, uh, they call old men. Uh, we must be like uh, 10, 20 of us in, uh, in, uh, at the Abuja campus. So quite busy. They didn't notice if, if some friends were not calling me again. If they did not, well, not to, not, nothing to worry about. Just focus on what were your achievements. What were the things you set out to do when you uh, assumed the responsibility of the Office of the Minister for Transport? Did you achieve them? What legacies did you leave in Port Harcourt? A lot. Primary schools, secondary schools. Uh, health, health centers, general hospitals, the, the dental hospital, uh, the Songhai farm, electricity, power stations that you had to build. Quite a lot of things to, to bother yourself about. And then uh, the U.S., yes, of course, uh, a lot of time to sleep and find time for my poor wife who didn't have the opportunity of seeing me from when she got, when she got married to me. Don't forget, we got married and then by by 1999 I had become speaker and from them only God knows what has happened. So from speaker to governor, from governor to minister to being the DG of the campaign of the last government twice, huge responsibilities that got my marriage uh, seeing me as an, abs an as, almost as an absentee husband. But he, Believe me, my wife was just a wonder, was such a wonderful manager, managing me, managing my responsibilities, managing the, the children, and making sure that they kept their relationship with their father so that they don't begin to see me as, as an uncle. You certainly had very huge responsibilities over the past 25 or so years. Good to know that you get more sleep now. Are you done with your political career, or will you run again in 2027 or beyond? Let me tell what's going on now. Uh, I'm sure that Ruth is just being smart. She's letting you to ask that question because we agree that no political questions. So the answer to that comment, uh, question will be no comments. <laughs> uh, she, she is not keeping to the agreement. The agreement is no political questions. The only questions you can ask is life after office. I agree with you. I agree with you, Honorable Minister, and I do apologize for that. Life after yeah, office. No. You know, you're always a very honest person. You've always been brutally honest. <laughs> so my next question is going to go to that. Being too honest does not always endear you to everyone all the time. However, they will know what you're saying, you're saying what's on your mind. But some might argue that being more magnanimous is more politically correct. They will say the greatest win is walking away and choosing not to engage in drama and toxic energy at all. 
So how would you describe, what, what, would you, what is your take on this? Do you believe in saying what you want to say, no matter who, whose ox is God, or do you believe in being politically correct? And it's not a political question. It's, <laughs> a, it's not a political question. <laughs> Uh, Ruth, even there's a political question, but I will answer this. The reason why I will answer this is that it has to do with character. <laughs> the difference between me and most Nigerian elites, <laughs> most, most Nigerian, the difference between me and most Nigerian elites is that I say it the way it is. And I say it unknowingly. People just think that, oh, he's, he just said it because he wants to hurt me. No, that's the way God had brought me up. And I've asked God, why did he bring me up in that manner? I will tell you the truth, even if he put a gun on my head. Okay. Yeah. Whether it's politics, whether it's at home, or whether it is with my wife or with my children. I must do that. And the reason, I think, I suspect that the reason why I acquired that character was because of the, my fear of God. I've always believed that I should go to heaven. Mm. And one way to go to heaven is to be honest to mankind and be honest to yourself. When you are wrong, you say, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Mm. When you are not wrong, you say, I am not wrong. I, I have a friend who says, look, one bad and good thing about you, and my bishop said it also in the church, on my final uh, Catholic service, uh, church, church service after I left the office as governor. He said, your best quality gets you your best friend, and at the same time gets you your worst friends. What's your best quality? Saying, being honest and saying the truth all the time. And he asked me, what would I choose? Ruth, I choose to be honest all my life. What about diplomacy? <laughs> diplomacy. Don't you, sometimes, don't you have to sort of exaggerate if the truth or downplay like, the truth? It, it, just to be politically correct. Sorry to use that word, politics. Politic I don't <laughs> like it. If, I, I don't want to be politically correct. I don't want to be, I don't want to be politically, politically correct, Ruth. If diplomacy means lying, then I won't lie. The best you can get of me or the worst you can get of, out of me at that material time is to walk away from that place instead of me to lie. And if, if you say you're my friend and you know me, you know that is one thing you're going to get. Interesting. Yes, honesty is indeed a very good political trait or general trait in life. What is one piece... <laughs> right, so no more political questions. What is one piece of advice or wisdom that you consider crucial for personal growth and success? I've always discouraged those who want to leave the country. I said 9 to 5. 9 to 5, yes. You can always get a 9 to 5 job when you leave the country. But you can never get the opportunity you will get in Nigeria. You can just wake up one day, you become a minister in Nigeria. You can just wake up one day, you become... Uh, a governor. It just happens. I, I, I don't know what kind of, how, how this country operates. So if you're looking for opportunity, please stay back in Nigeria. If you're looking for nine to five safety and all that, one of my friends said to me, but supposing you're waiting for that opportunity and they, they kill you. Okay. Well, maybe that, that's your destiny. Well, but you, honestly, the example you honestly, just gave the opportunities is, are here. Right. The example you just gave is for 5,000 or less positions, but we have 250 million people in this land of opportunities. So if you don't want it to jack where are the opportunities? You well, said there's... You, 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 no, no, you, you, you just assume the opportunity is about being in public office. Just the Let's example. I'm saying that based on your example. There are about something million Nigerians. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. So I'm, I'm leaving that example now. Okay. So there are about 200, about 200 million Nigerians. Just assume that you start cooking um, more money and you sell to 10 million Nigerians at one naira. How much is that? But exactly. that's about, we also I think have, that's about 10 million. Yeah, but we are losing our best hands. Whether we like it or not, we cannot downplay the effect that Jakba is having in Nigeria as a whole. Uh, uh, it, it, it. Especially in the medical field. We are losing the best of our doctors uh, when it comes to this. <laughs> so whether we like it or not, avoiding, the situation... I'm avoiding where you're going to. No, no, no. It's, I'm not, and it's not about politics now. We're just talking about welfare of Nigerians in general. Why are they leaving the shores of Nigeria? You, they are you, moving on to greener pastures. You can't discuss... Is that is it a political question? The welfare of Nigeria without discussing politics. It well, is, because you, you have to discuss with the issue of economy, who manages the economy, the government. You have to discuss the issue of safety and security, who manages safety and security, the government. You have to discuss the issue of uh, uh, the creation of opportunities, the creation of employment, and all that. So, what you can tell is uh, Nigerians get what they want, <laughs> Nigerians get what they, <laughs> what they deserve. You, you don't complain after. You don't. I think that, yes, well, and I, I say that because you had opportunity, you had opportunity, Nigerians at all times, Ruth, can you please let me, Nigerians at all times have had opportunity to, to, to vote. 
from okay. exactly. So okay. whatever you voted for is what you deserve now. <laughs> but again, again Ruth, if, let's not go into right. politics, okay, please. Oh, Just I've fair. given you the okay, rule. Okay, my lips yes. are zipped. Mm. <laughs> zipped. No more. I didn't. I didn't say that. I didn't say the elections are not always free and fair. No, I'm saying you are that. saying that. I'm saying you that. You are saying that. Yes. Elections are not always free. So Nigerians are not getting what not, they yes, voted for. I have not said that. Oh, okay. Okay. So in that sense, anyway, like I said, I don't know why. You again say. You again. You again say that. You again say that. Oh my goodness, elephant in the room, so to speak. But anyway, um, HM, it's been interesting to hear you talk. So looking back now to what you've been through and your experience that you have had, and if you had to advise younger Nigerians about their belief in Nigeria, what would you say to them? I asked your colleague the same question. So to round up, if you had to advise younger Nigerians on how to be in a better frame of mind and how to give them hope and inspire them, what would you advise them? in the Nigeria of today? I will ask them to look at my situation. That's what I will ask them to do. I, I, I started off with be, being born to a poor family. My father was a dispensing pharmacist. Found it difficult to train my siblings. I was lucky to be trained. My siblings were not, didn't go to university. Uh, anybody who went to university was after me, and I trained, and I had, to, I had the responsibility of having to get, get them through the university. I paid their fees, I got all my, all my siblings, all. I had to get them through the university, and uh, some of them are working, some are not working. Uh, so what did I do? It, the struggle, you just have to struggle. The elites will not let you join the elite class. They will not. You just have to push and um, continue to push until you push yourself into being part of the elite. And then they, they, and be part of the economy. The problem we have in Nigeria is once you get that opportunity, you don't want to expand that economy to allow more persons to come in. I usually tell people when they talk about crime, I say the reason why you have crime is that the economy is too small. The economy is not able to absorb everybody. You know, if, if you... I repeat what I used to say when I was governor. If all of us were working in Shell, there would be no time to go and rob. There would be no time to go and kidnap because you leave at 6 a.m. to go to work. By the time you come back at 6 p.m., you're too tired. You have to sleep. So my advice to them is get your degree if you can. If you can't, uh, well, I'm lucky. You say that because my father did anyway. everything possible to make sure I get, oh, I get out of the university of Putaco. Hey, thank you so much. And I, them luck I, I need to ask you one more question. <laughs> yeah. We are rounding off soon. I remember we asked your colleague yes. about music. I hear you released an album. Wait, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> I didn't know you had music. <laughs> <laughs> Are we expecting another album so anytime soon? Are we soon? expecting you uh, to be no, jumping no, on stage no, no, like no, that? No, no, no. When is the next album? <laughs> <laughs> they say you released album. Ah, HM, you Ruth, don't tell me that I'm one. I'm a Catholic. <laughs> Ruth, Ruth, I'm a Catholic. I'm a Catholic. Now, there is this choir group in the church that usually visits me from time to time. The last visit was my wife's birthday, okay. and they wanted my wife and I to. Re to sing for them the psalm for that Sunday. And we oh. did that for them. That's what we do. We've done it about three times. But in terms of music, I, I follow all of them. I follow David Doe, I follow uh, Wizkid, I follow Tiwa Savage, I follow but Bonaboy. Okay. I am a greater fan of Bonaboy because of the kind of music he plays. And I listen to all of them. But my greatest music now is Ababola. What's Ababola? I like that song too. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Amabola, that means you're not, not current. <laughs> I I flavor, flavor. It's such a good song. Who is Amabola by? Mo Money is not Money it. Is not Money is not it. Amabola. Amabola. See, you know it. Yes, I know it. I know it. I know it. I actually love it. Yes, uh, uh, How much is money? Flavor. Flavor, yes. Yes, uh, Money is not We all love that song. Yes, I love that. I love that. Now you know. Now you know. HM, thank you so much for being with Absolutely. us. Absolutely. It was a thrilling, afternoon, thrilling morning. Thank you so much for being with us. And we hope that you will come again on our show sometime soon to be with us. Absolutely. Thank you so thank much you. for being with us. Happy Thanks. birthday to you. Happy sister, happy sister birthday, Ruth. Coming up soon. Hey. Some of us are getting there. We'll be there, we'll be there next year. We'll HM, there there you were there, you were there for 50. You must be there for 60. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You were there for 50. I'll be there. I'll be there. But you're looking great and you're not looking 60. You're looking You're not looking 60. Sweet 16. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us on Perspectives. See you soon. <laughs> now again, sometimes you need a push to help you move from a situation that no longer serves you. Life can become a daring adventure when your only available transportation is a leap of faith. You see, even if yesterday is not ours to recover, tomorrow is ours to win or lose. We can only find our true direction when we let the wind of change carry us. In the end, it's not the years in your life that counts. 
is a life in your ears. And of course, as always, remember, life is a learning curve. That's all we have time for you today. You've been watching Perspectives here on, on Arise News with me, Ruth Osimia. See you next week. And with me, Ola Torreira Majakudimi Oniru. And now the final wrap up. Not everyone is born or trainable to be a leader. Some people stumble upon leadership positions and some hijack, refine themselves and run in any direction. Successful leaders deliver results in office and after office. As we reflect on leadership choices and legacies, let us aspire to cultivate a world of peace, unity and progress while leaving behind a legacy of democratic transitions for the success of many, many generations to come. Again, my name is Ola Torreira Majakudimi Oniru, and I love all things greater humanity. Thank you for watching Perspectives. Have a great weekend. See you all soon. Goodbye.